online, they if they have some quick to introduce uh, Aditya, and then Aditya is an assistant professor at the Carnegie Mellon University in the Department of Statistics and Data Science, and also the Machine Learning Department. His work is supported by National Science Foundation Career Award uh, for uh, online multiple hypothesis testing, and then Adobe Faculty Research Award on the Quantai AB testing and bandits and the ARL uh, large grants on the safe reinforcement learning site and a block center grant on election auditing, among others. Um, Aditya's theoretical and methodology research is motivated by the following questions. Uh, how should we capture prediction uncertainty for black box machine learning algorithms? How can we quantify estimation uncertainty in sequential setting? And how can we avoid making false discoveries while testing tens of thousands of hypotheses? How can we involve a human in the loop during scientific data collection analysis? His areas of applied interest include experimentation in the IT industry, neuroscience, genetics, and, and auditing. Uh, without further ado, uh, let's welcome uh, Aditya for the talk. Yeah, right. Aditya, it's yours. Yeah, you can share your slides. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Lee, for the introduction and, and thanks for the invitation as well. Um, so hopefully all of you can see my slides now. Yeah. That's um, right. So I'll be talking to you about uh, uh, this area, which I call distribution free uncertainty quantification. It's, a, um, it's an area that's been around for a couple of decades, but I think over the last uh, four or five years, there's been an uh, explosion of interest because of progress that's been made both theoretically and methodologically and also um, uh, application software, things like that. So quite excited to share. Uh, I've been part of this progress over the last few years and I'm, I'll try to give a summary of this area to all of you today. Um, so uh, here's a precursor of something coming up on uh, July 24th uh, this summer at ICML. There'll be a workshop on this topic. It's, it's on distribution free UQ. And uh, um, we're, you know, we have a nice uh, set of organizers and a set of uh, speakers. And so you can think about this talk as being uh, uh, an, an introduction to uh, what is this workshop about? So if you find the talk interesting, hopefully the, the whole day workshop uh, will be interesting to you as well. And we can maybe um, also hope to see some uh, submissions uh, from some of you. Uh, so I'll be, uh, uh, you know, the, the work I'll be talking about today uh, will be joint work with several people. Uh, my, my PhD students um, are in, you know, some in machine learning and some in statistics um, have done a, a lot of this work. And uh, so I want to acknowledge them properly. And uh, some of my faculty collaborators are mentioned as well, Rina, Emmanuel, Ryan, Larry and Arun. Uh, some of them are at CMU and uh, Rina uh, Rina's at uh, uh, Chicago, Emmanuel's at Stanford. And my students, Chirag, um, Sasha, and Robin uh, have contributed greatly to this effort. Okay, so I'm going to talk about, uh, you know, broadly two uh, separate themes, two separate ways of quantifying uncertainty. Um, the first one will be called, you know, it's called conformal prediction. The second one will be called calibration. And the key part to both of these is the, the phrase in the title, which is distribution free. I will clarify what that means, but essentially at a high level, it means without making any distribution assumptions on the data whatsoever, can we quantify uh, uncertainty of those of the predictions that uh, any algorithm, any black box machine learning algorithm is making. So um, that's that's going to be the goal. Okay, so what do we think of as a prediction in machine learning? You know, so we. Um, we have some training data, X um, uh, is the covariates, Y is the label space, both X and Y are completely general, um, but maybe for simplicity, you can think about X as being, you know, D-dimensional Euclidean uh, coordinates and, and Y as being a, a real value if you're doing regression or a, a label if you're doing classification. So we're given uh, a bag of, uh, of training data, uh, N training data points. There's a new data point Xn plus one that's drawn from the same distribution. And we would like to make a prediction for Y on that point. So how do we do that? We pick, we pick an algorithm. So this could be random forest, k nearest neighbors, deep learning, anything. And uh, we use the algorithm to come up with a predictor. Um, and so a predictor is just a mapping from um, covariate space X to uh, 
y prime and the y prime could be the same as y or you know, slightly different so for example when doing binary classification your original space script y could just be the set 0 and 1 but y prime could be the interval 0 to 1 in case you're producing a probabilistic classifier so um, y prime may or may not be the same as y so you 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 train a predictor using this algorithm and um, and what is an algorithm an algorithm is just anything that takes in some number of data points and spits out a predictor so like random forest could be thought of as an algorithm it, you know you can give it 500 data points or 1000 in any case, it'll take in those data points and it'll spit out a mapping from uh, covariates to label space. Okay, so you pick your favorite algorithm, you come up with a predictor, and then you apply your predictor to Xn plus one and, and you get a prediction for that point. So um, that's what we think of as, as prediction. What is predictive inference? Um, uh, all that means is we're not interested just in predicting a point value, A of Xn plus one, we want to quantify uncertainty. We want to say um, that uh, y n plus one is in a set with high probability. Okay, so we we would like this kind of a probabilistic guarantee um, where this dotted line is just a visualization of a confidence set C n, or we call it a prediction set C n. It's a prediction set because well, we're trying to predict y n plus one, and we would like y n plus one to be contained in that set with, with high probability. So you should think of alpha as 0 0.01 or 0 0.05, and then this would be a 95% or a 99% um, prediction set for yn plus one. So that's the kind of guarantee we'll be going for. So instead of making point predictions, we'll make set predictions, and, and the set will contain the true label with high probability. Okay, so that's the, you know, that's gonna be for, you know, most of this talk, I would say, for 40 minutes or 35 minutes of this talk, it'll be that. And then at the end, I'll just switch a little bit to calibration because that's also uh, a popular way of quantifying uncertainty. So why do we want to do predictive inference? Why do we want um, a guarantee of the style that, um, you know, yn plus one is in, in a set with high probability? Let's just take an example for intuition. Um, let's say that y is, you know, some kind of time taken to go to the airport and x is, at, you know, some particular time of the day. If I just tell you that it's going to take you 80 minutes to get to the airport, that's not very useful for you because the way you will act when uh, it will take 80 plus or minus five minutes or 80 plus or minus 40 minutes is going to be very different. Um, and so even though the mean prediction in some sense is the same for both of those intervals, you will act very differently in both of those two situations. And so in general, to make real world decisions based on predictions, we need to quantify uncertainty of those predictions. How confident are we about the claims that we're making? Um, or rather, how confident is the regressor or classifier about the claims it is making? So what is distribution free now? So I've told you what predictive inference means. What is distribution free predictive inference? Here, there's going to be a little bit more notation, but it's not complicated at all. So I'm going to uh, summarize the label data set by DN. So that's just x1, y1 to xn, yn, as I uh, introduced earlier. And these are, we, we assume that these are coming from a, a IID from a joint distribution. Uh, Pxy is the joint distribution, which you can think of as Px times P of y given x. So Px is the marginal on x, P of y given x is the conditional of y given x. Or you can think of it as just the joint distribution Pxy. Okay, so we're given that. Now you have any algorithm of your choice. So th this framework uh, does not restrict in any way the distribution or the algorithm. So you can pick your favorite algorithm. Uh, um, now you have a new point, xn plus one, which is drawn from uh, the same marginal distribution px. And the aim is to produce a set. Uh, this set is a data dependent set. It depends on the training data that you've seen and on the last point. So we, we label it cn of xn plus one. Uh, the cn quantifies that it's data dependent on the first 10 points and it's applied on xn plus one. Um, and it's really a function you know, of the algorithm of the data set and xn plus one. And now that's a subset typically of y. Typically, it could be of y prime as we have said, which is, um, but, but you can think of this as a sub, you know, I produce a subset of y and the guarantee I would like for that subset is very powerful. I would like the guarantee that for any distribution pxy, for any algorithm a, no assumptions made on the distribution or on the algorithm the probability that y n plus one lies in this set is at least one minus alpha. Okay, so this is what one means by distribution free. The for all p x y outside makes it distribution free. Technically, 
the for all algorithms a makes it algorithm free also so it's like distribution free and algorithm agnostic you can think about it that way so the set itself cn of xn plus 1 it will change with the distribution because cn is a function of the data that you have seen so far it will change uh, with the distribution it will change with the algorithm for different algorithms might produce different sets but the guarantee is never affected if you have a very nice distribution uh, of the covariates it's not heavy tailed it's you know bounded uh, you know things of that kind nice that's good for you if you have a very heavy tailed distribution or very uh, very noisy data maybe y given x is um, uh, not continuous no problem the guarantee cannot fail you will get a 1 minus alpha guarantee regardless of any assumptions you don't have to make any assumptions on the data distribution or on the algorithm for the guarantee to hold okay so that's um that's the framework that we're going to be in so this was uh, started out this uh, you know definition or this area was started out by uh, vladimir wolf glen shafer and several other collaborators uh, over the last 20 years um but as i said there's been a lot of recent progress uh, from my group and from others that i'll i'll uh, summarize a little bit today so here are a few quick remarks about this uh, this goal that we're interested in so the first is we don't actually need the data to be iit you actually just need the data to be uh, exchangeable and if you if you don't know what exchangeable means you you can just think about it that that as the the labels don't matter like which point you call you know point 1 and which one you call point 5 it doesn't really matter uh, uh, another more formally exchangeable means that the distribution of the data is invariant to permutations um so it's a slightly weaker assumption but if you're not familiar with exchangeability you can just think about the data as being iit the algorithm itself is optional in some sense the stuff in blue you can you can delete if you want like uh, technically the goal of uh, the area is just the stuff even without the stuff in blue um, just i have some data i have a new point i want to produce a set which is which is valid for all distributions now this uh, goal is trivial if i don't introduce some kind of size or efficiency requirement so why is it trivial i can always output the set script y i can just output the whole set um and then obviously yn plus 1 is in that set not just with probability 1 minus alpha uh, but with probability 1 so uh, as you'll see going ahead we are we are going to be interested not just in achieving this uh, with uh, at least 1 minus alpha but basically with equality with 1 minus alpha around so you really want a 95% interval you don't want a you know 99.99% interval if you asked for a 95% interval um the fourth point is that this probability in the statement is actually over all randomness so this could be randomness in the algorithm um it's randomness of uh, uh, x1 y1 to xn yn and xn plus 1 yn plus 1 so this probability is really over the entire joint distribution over all n plus 1 points and any anything in the algorithm and uh, it's important it's like not conditional on xn plus 1 so another very reasonable notion of uh uncertainty would be to say i i also want uh, this probability to be conditional on xn plus 1 um in fact maybe you know if we have time we can discuss it uh, at the very end of the talk but we have negative results showing that um essentially um conditional on xn plus 1 that's impossible impossible in the sense that every uh, distribution free prediction set that has a conditional guarantee must have an um, infinite size and so uh, so typically we we are not going to be able to get conditional guarantees um uh, under such weak assumptions um and we can only get marginal guarantees of this type okay so hopefully at this point the goal uh, is clear but let me see uh, let me pause and see if there are any questions before i present the first algorithm to achieve this goal good continue yeah okay thank you all right so the first um uh, algorithm we, you know it's called split conformal prediction um it was you know many authors have you know talked about it introduced it in various forms over the years um i'll present a version that's from uh, you know uh, earlier work even though we have slightly different variants of of the same idea so um as we said we start out with some training data uh it's ex this is an extremely simple method which is why i want to start out by presenting that first and then we'll get to more sophisticated methods later on so uh, we split our data into two parts uh, d1 and d2 on the first part d1 we train remember any predictor so you pick any algorithm script a 
and you apply that to D1 and you get a predictor, um, which is a mapping from uh, X to Y. Um, now using this algorithm that you've trained on the first half, on the second half, you calculate some holdout scores. Now this could be, uh, this could this is actually just any function um, of the second set of data D2. Um, uh, you know, the, this kind of captures how good the prediction um, A of XI, um, how good is it at capturing YI? So, you know, if, if, you're, if you're doing regression, you can think about this as a difference between Y and A of X. If you're doing classification, you know, we'll, we'll come to it. But this is just any function you can come up with that quantifies, I call it a residual. Uh, we quantify how good the prediction is on the held out data. Or uh, you can call it a score as well. So let um, R bar, uh, be the set of these residuals that you calculate on the second half of the data. So you train the algorithm on the first half, you calculate its residuals on the second half. Okay, and uh, now let Q1 minus alpha of R bar, that I'm, I'm just using that uh, terminology as the one minus alpha quantile of that set of residuals. So R bar is just a set of real numbers. So the set R bar is going to look like 1.1, 2.8, 3.2, 1.5, you know, it's just a set of numbers. And so I'm going to take the one minus alpha quantile of that set of numbers, which is like I sort the numbers and then I take the 95th percentile, the thing that's the, that's almost the largest one. So, but the close to the largest one, the 0.95 quantile. So I take that, I call I call that Q, Q1 minus alpha of R bar. Um, and then I put those two together to form my prediction set. So my prediction set is the set of all y, the set of all labels, such that um, the when I calculate the score on xn plus one and y, it is less than this q1 minus alpha of r bar. Okay, so I'll, I'll try different y's and all the y's that lead to a small residual, how small? Smaller than the 95th percentile on the held out set. All those that lead to a small residual, I'll say, that's a plausible Y. I'll keep it in my set. It's plausible. And the theorem is that for any algorithm that you used and for any data set, so any distribution of the data that you use, the probability that YN plus one lies in the set is at least one minus alpha. So that's the guarantee. And you have this double, this other sided guarantee, which is it's not just at least one minus alpha. If the these residual scores if these don't have ties, if they are actually distinct, if they are distinct with probability one, then um, then you get an upper bound on that probability also, which is at most one minus alpha plus around one over n. Uh, n two is the size of d two, so if a plus two two over n, if you want to think about it that way. Um, so now you're seeing that this is not just at least ninety five percent; it's also at at most ninety five point two percent or something of that kind. So it's giving you this two sided guarantee. And it's a very simple algorithm to run because you can run it for any problem, any classification problem, any regression problem, any algorithm of your choice, any distribution. You can apply this to today. Uh, you know, it's a, a, an undergraduate can implement this and it immediately gives you a, a prediction interval. So here's one simple example for intuition's sake. Suppose you define your residual um, as the stuff in yellow. If you define it as this difference between YI and A of XI, you would do this if you're doing real valued regression then this is a sensible notion of residual. Then the set, CN of the, the prediction set that's output is actually just A of XN plus one, the, the prediction made by algorithm A on the new point, plus or minus this, this one minus alpha quantile of the residuals, which is a very sensible thing to do. Um, and, uh, and so at least in, in that case, it recovers something that we think, oh yeah, that, that's what, so, something like that is what we would have intuitively come up with anyway and you know that's that's kind of what it's doing but now it generalizes that notion to any other type of residual that you might like and so i'll give you some lots of examples of types of residuals um, on the next couple of slides okay so here's a figure uh, of a simulation that i've borrowed from again an, an earlier paper this is lay wasserman ronaldo and Tipshirani. these are my colleagues in the uh, stat department at cmu so what you question before you go to the uh, uh, example in the previous yes. slide you split yes. the difference into two d1 and d2 yeah and and it looks like that this guarantee that doesn't have anything to do with the you know m1 you know it, that's you, right in the end you get expression which has something to do with n2 
That's right. You can condition on D1. So in this particular algorithm, the, the guarantee holds conditional on D1. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, and also you're right. Yeah, you could have just picked any pre-trained algorithm completely. It need not have been trained on D1. You can just pick any pre-trained algorithm and you can essentially like calibrate it using all of the data if you want. So the, the first split is just to pick some predictor. But if you already have some predictor from uh, some other old offline data that you have something of that kind, you can use that and you can calibrate it using this data. So you're completely right that really the guarantee is on D, is on D2. So, so uh, I mean, at the initial side, it looks a little bit uh, counterintuitive because typically when we talk about generalization, uh, I mean, this is not generalization, but uh, confidence or uncertainty quantification. Yes. I mean, when we talk about generalization, typically the training data set M1 will, will affect your prediction, you know, in a, in a test case or something. But here, uh, I guess it's because you're conditioning on the uh, D1 and A, okay. Yeah, I mean, the first half of the data uh, does affect it as well because um, uh, it affects the center point, in, in this case, the center point of the interval or you know, it, it does affect the size of the residuals. If your first half, if your predictor that you used was not very good, then mm -hmm. these residuals will be large and the quantile will be large and the prediction set will be large. And, and so the, the quality uh, or the generalization ability of that predictor, if the predictor is really overfitting on the first half of the data, then when you apply it on the second half, the residuals will be very large. You'll see that it's not able to predict well out of sample. And then the prediction interval will also be really large. So, so somehow it, it is captured implicitly in the size of the set, but not in the guarantee of the set. I see. Right. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So, so here's an interesting example. It's just a simple one for visualization. Here, the x is univariate. That's on the x-axis. It's just you know zero to six, um, and and y is also just univariate. And we're doing regression. Um, in gray circles are plotted the true data points. And one thing you'll notice with the true data points, it's the same figure on the left and the right in terms of the raw data is exactly the same, um, is that uh, you have something called heteroscedastic noise, which means that the noise is a function of X. In this case, you have very low noise on the left and very high noise on the right. And so the mean function, which is plotted in red and in blue on the two slides, they're exactly the same mean function. The mean function, uh, captures the expected value of y given x, but the variance of y given x is different, is, is varying as a function of x. And so this is just an interesting example to see what, what, what can we do. So here the underlying algorithm that is being used is you know, just some, some kind of uh, regression spline algorithm. You can think about it as applying kernel regression with a, a cubic kernel or you know, something of that kind. And um, so that's the underlying algorithm A that's being used. And the only thing I'm changing on the left and the right is the definition of the residual. And on the left, we're using the residual that we mentioned on the previous slide, just y minus a of x. And on the right, we're using a slightly different notion of residual, which is y minus a of x divided by sigma of x. So what is sigma of x? It's another algorithm that is trained to predict not the mean of y given x, but the variance of y given x. And so um, you can use regression algorithms for prediction, predicting conditional variance as well, just like you do for conditional mean, you can do for conditional variance. And you can use these two algorithms, A and sigma, to define a new residual, uh, Ri. Um, and then you push it through the conformal prediction framework. You say, okay, I'm going to train on the first half. I'm going to randomly split my data into two halves, uh, train A and sigma, on the first half, calculate the residuals on the second half. Uh, and then on a new point, I'll, I'll make a, a prediction which, come, uh, which was mentioned in the previous slide, the set of all Y for which the residual on the new point is at most the one minus alpha quantile of the residuals on the held out data. And, uh, and what you're seeing is the shape of those. So uh, as I vary Xn plus one, so here I'm varying Xn plus one uh, as you know uh, from left to right. And for each Xn plus one, I can see what does this algorithm predict? Um, and you know, obviously the, the one on the right is more sensible than the one on the left, but this just brings out how important it is to capture the notion of residual correctly. So while it is, while the algorithm is correct for any notion of residual, it is more useful if you picked your algorithm sensibly and you've picked your residual sensibly, you'll get more useful answers. So the both the left and the right, they have coverage one minus alpha on average, but the, the one on the left, um, so we call there's something called local coverage or conditional coverage. The one on the left is over covering 
um, uh, on the left part, which means it has coverage one on the left and it's under covering on the right, which means it has coverage maybe 80% on the right. But like on average, it's a 95% interval. That is what's guaranteed by the, the framework. Uh, but on the right, what you see is that, uh, you know, it's kind of getting 95% coverage everywhere, like from left to right. So um, it's achieving more than, uh, you know, marginal coverage, it's achieving conditional coverage. And so in, in practice, the theorem can only guarantee uh, coverage on average over X. Uh, but you, what you see is if you pick the algorithm and, and uh, 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 residual score function sensibly, you get uh, conditional coverage as well. And and the way you know the length is varying, and so you can get all of these phenomena by by picking the residual. So this is a simple regression example. I'll show you a simple classification example. So the plot above and below are two different uh, examples completely. Uh, the one on the, on the top is a three class example. So the true data set is a mixture of three Gaussians. Um, so the data is two dimensional. So now the X is two dimensional and the Y is only uh, in colors. Um, and the data set below is also two dimensional uh, and, and the labels are only in colors. And this is both of the, so the one below is a mixture of two Gaussians. Uh, you know, maybe the one below the, the Gaussians are centered at maybe minus two and plus two or, you know, something like that, maybe minus 1.5 and plus 1.5. And uh, the one above the, the three Gaussians are centered, they're like a triangle of Gaussians. So um, the yellow, the blue and the pink are like the triangle of Gaussians. And what you're seeing over here is the prediction sets that are produced by conformal prediction using a particular residual function. So the, re the, the residual might, it might look complicated, but uh, uh, you know, what it really is, is um, on the held out data, um, you know, our, we train a classifier, a probabilistic classifier on the first half, like logistic regression or something of that kind, multi-class logistic regression uh, or multi-class SVM, anything. In this case, we trained a probabilistic classifier. And then on the second half of the data, uh, on points that we have not seen, um, the probabilistic classifier produces uh, a probability for each label. And so we can ask what is the to total probability of labels that were um, you know, deemed to be more likely than YI. Okay, so the true label may be class two, but maybe class two occurs in the second position, not in the first position. So you know, maybe your algorithm determines class one to be more likely even though the true label is class two. So we can ask what is the probability it assigned to class one? So that's a notion of how badly it's doing or how well it's doing. So that's a notion of uh, residual. And when you use that notion of residual and you push it through the conformal prediction framework, it gives you um, these two images. So very interpretable. So what you're seeing is that right in the middle of the image, which is really where it's most confused about which class it's coming from, um, the prediction set is one, two, and three. And there it's saying, I don't know, I'm really confused. It could be any of those labels. Um, and that's the darkest, the black uh, in the middle is one, two, and three in, in the top plot. Um, but in the outermost parts, where the, the yellow, it's sure it's class one. The pink, it's sure it's class three. And the blue, it's sure it's class two. And that's also sensible because these are very far away from the decision boundary. And very close to the decision boundary of the classes, the orange, it's saying I'm confused between one and three. Uh, you know, the green, I'm confused between one and two. And maroon, I'm confused between two and three. So it's producing a very sensible, interpretable output. These are very natural prediction sets. But the important part about it is the algorithm did not need to know anything about the data generating distribution. I just, for a simulation, I generated from a, uh, a mixture of three Gaussians, but it is completely agnostic to the distribution that the data are coming from and what algorithm I use. I happen to use multi-class logistic regression maybe for this, but you can say, I want to use random forest. That's completely fine. The, it will still have a, a theoretically guaranteed coverage um, uh, and, and, and very interpretable sets. Um, of course, the exact shape of the sets or the exact where the boundaries of these sets will be, they'll differ depending on the distribution and depending on the algorithm you chose to use. Um, so that doesn't mean that you should not choose the algorithm sensibly. Uh, if you don't choose a sensible algorithm, then you might get uh, trivial sets, which means it, like one, two, and three, it might appear in more parts of the, of the figure. But if you uh, typically machine learning, you know, apply, applied machine learning people have a good idea of what types of algorithms will work well on, on the data. So if you use, if you choose your algorithms in a sensible way, you get very interpretable and sensible sets out of it. So the one below is also sensible. Near the decision boundary, it says I'm confused here, I'm going to output zero and one because I'm not exactly sure, but a little bit further away from the decision boundary, it starts to say here, I'm sure it's just zero or just one. Okay, 
So just another simple example of, of how to apply this case, uh, split conformal prediction to two different, or regression problem, classification problem. Okay, but now you can say, um, well, I don't want to split my data. Okay, I don't like sample splitting. I'm, I'm using only half my data for training and half my data for calibration. You know, I, I would like to use all of my data or something of that kind. So I'm going to predict, present a method which is based on leave one out ideas. So um, uh, I'll first present an idea that doesn't work and then I'll show you an idea that fixes it. Okay, so this is a very common idea in the literature. It, it stems from the 1940s. It's called the leave one out jackknife. Um, and the idea is that you, you train N different predictors each time by leaving out a different data point. Okay, so here I'm denoting A minus I as the predictor you get by applying your algorithm A on the data set when you leave out X, I, Y, I. Okay, so here, this is more computationally intensive. You have to apply your algorithm N times. Okay, so fine, let's say you do that. You can now calculate N leave one out scores. So these leave one out scores are just the I leave one out score R, I is how did A minus I do on X, I, Y, I. So A minus I did not see X, I, Y, I in training. So you can ask how did it do for uh, uh, prediction on XIYI. So here I'm not using a general score for simplicity. I'm just going to instantiate the score to this particular one. But as before, you can use any other score function if you want, uh, and it, it'll be fine. So you can apply it to classification too, but I'll just show this regression case for intuition. Okay, so let R bar as before be the set of uh, all N uh, leave one out residuals. Let Q one minus alpha of R bar be the one minus alpha quantile. Earlier we used only N over two points for the quantiles and the held, the held out scores here. Now we are doing all endpoints. Um, and so what the jackknife does, so this is a classical method is it says, I will take my algorithm A, which is trained on all my data. I'll apply it on XN plus one, and I will add and subtract the one minus alpha quantile of R bar. Okay, and so this was, uh, you know, proposed by Kenwi in 1947, uh, really popularized by two key um, uh, who came up with a fast Fourier transform and is known for many other things uh, in the 1970s. Um, but unfortunately, we can prove that this does not have a guarantee, which means that there exists a distribution and al an algorithm such that this probability of coverage is not 95%, it's actually zero. Okay, so this uh, algorithm is sensible, it is intuitive, but it does not have any mathematical guarantees in general. No, at least not in any distribution-free and algorithm-free sense, it does not have any guarantees. So uh, we're going to fix this. This is, again shows maybe, it perhaps shows the importance of math. Maybe you can come up with intuitive and good ideas, but sometimes like making the math work out is, is not the same thing. So we'll propose a variant that we call Jackknife Plus. This was published recently in a paper at the Annals of Statistics. It just appeared a couple of months ago. Um, and and so here I've written on the slide, uh, the uh, CJ of XN plus one is the same uh, method as before, which has no guarantees. Uh, and I'll write down now the method that we have, which is a simple fix. But for that, I'm just gonna rewrite the CJ in a slightly different fashion. So you can just see that actually what this, the left endpoint of the jackknife interval is the alpha quantile of A of XN plus one minus RI, um, so A of XN plus one minus R1, A of XN plus one minus R2, that set, you take the alpha quantile. And the right endpoint is the one minus alpha quantile of A of XN plus one plus RI. Okay, so it's centered at A of XN plus one and I subtract RI and take the alpha quantile, I add RI and take the one minus alpha quantile. That's exactly the jackknife interval. So what we are going to do is a very minor change. Okay, so the jackknife plus interval says that when I take the alpha quantile or the one minus alpha quantile, I'll not use the same A of XN plus one each time. I'll use A minus I of XN plus one because that's what RI was tuned to. RI captured the uncertainty of A minus I. And so I should take A minus one of XN plus one when I and subtract R1. And I should take A minus two of XN plus one and subtract R2. Um, and take the alpha quantile of that quantity and the one minus alpha of that quantity. And what you can prove is that for without, now earlier jackknife had no guarantees, but now the jackknife plus algorithm without any assumptions on the data of the algorithm has a one minus two alpha guarantee. And it's quite interesting if, you know, we can talk offline where this two comes from. This two is not uh, 
um, it's not an artifact of the analysis. We can show that two is tight in the sense that there are algorithms and there are distributions for which it achieves basically a one minus two alpha guarantee. But actually, uh, uh, typically in practice, it achieves one minus alpha. And so we can prove an additional theorem, which I'm not writing down here, which is if the algorithm is stable, if you've heard of this notion of algorithmic stability, if the algorithm is stable, then this guarantee becomes one minus alpha. If the algorithm is unstable, then it's actually one minus two alpha. So essentially what you can think about is that typically in practice, when you apply it, we hope we are working with stable algorithms. Jackknife plus will give you a one minus alpha guarantee. But by chance, if your distribution or your algorithm is unstable, which could happen with deep nets, sometimes they, they could uh, you know, have some un, uh, instabilities, then at least it won't crash to zero. It will still give you a one minus two alpha guarantee. You'll get a 90% guarantee instead of a 95% guarantee at least. So this kind of a robustness uh, statement that, that we're providing. And the jackknife does not have that statement, but the jackknife plus does have that statement. Um, now uh, you can ask, are there, um, you know, you know, this is an n fold D one out. So if n is large, if n is you know one billion, then you're not going to train n different predictors. Is there a version of this which is analogous to cross validation? And the answer is yes. So there's a k fold version of this as well. So we call this k fold CV plus. Um, and usually cross validation is used for a different purpose. It's used for model selection or something of that kind. Um, uh, here we're using that idea for quantifying uncertainty, predictive un uh, uncertainty. And so the idea is simple. So you, here I'm denoting A minus K as apply the algorithm to the data set uh, where you leave out all of the data points in the Kth fold, that's A minus K. Uh, you calculate N scores as before, but the N scores, uh, I don't have to train N algorithms for them. I only have to train K algorithms for them. Um, and when I'm calculating the Ith score, I leave out the entire fold that the Ith point belonged to. So that's what K of I means is that I leave out the kth fold uh, uh, if, the, if you know, the fold that I belong to, I leave out that fold. I, I use that predictor and I, I look at the score that way. I, and I, I do the same thing as before where I, uh, I take the one minus alpha quantile of the residuals and then the CV plus predictor um, takes the one alpha and one minus alpha quantile as before, but instead of, uh, but now I, you know, it's just, it, it's just a change as before. Like I, I leave out the kth fold, the fold that point I belonged to. And as before, we have a distribution free, algorithm free coverage guarantee. Um, and so now you get computational efficiency as well. Okay. And so uh, if you want to look at, uh, we have lots of experiments in the paper on you know, different synthetic as well as real data sets. If you want to get a feel for how these, uh, what are the trade-offs, computational and statistical trade-offs between these methods, then I encourage you to, to look at these papers. Okay, so uh, that's all I really wanted to say about uh, conformal prediction. Um, and I wanted to spend the last 10, 15 minutes on calibration. So this is just a summary. Um, if you do the naive method, by naive, I mean double dipping. You use all the data for prediction and use all the data for uncertainty quantification. There's no theory possible. And typically your intervals that you produce will have coverage less than one minus alpha. In fact, much less is, is typical. Um, if you use the split conformal prediction framework, then you as a, we, we prove a theorem that it gives you one minus alpha coverage. And typically in practice, it gives you one minus alpha coverage. So that's nice. Um, there's a method I did not uh, present in class, uh, so in in, uh, in the talk, which is called full conformal prediction, um, which uh, uh, is computationally infeasible, but it gives you one minus alpha coverage in theory, and uh, it gives you one minus alpha coverage in practice. But if your if your algorithm is capable of overfitting, then it, it could overcover. It give, it could give you larger than one minus alpha. I didn't present that because it's typically computationally infeasible, and nobody runs it. Um, the jackknife I presented, that's a classical method. There's no theory possible for it. Typically, when you apply it in practice, it does work well. Uh, it gives you one minus alpha coverage. But the problem is that if, it, if you are in an unstable situation, then it can, it can give drastically less than one minus alpha coverage in practice. It could drop from 95% to 80% or 50%. And you won't know. In practice, you don't know when you're applying it. If you're applying it in an unstable or stable situation, you don't know. So the jackknife is a little tricky. The jackknife plus... Um, it gives you one minus two alpha coverage without any uh, theoretical, without any assumptions. Uh, but when you apply it in practice, it typically gives you one minus alpha coverage. 
And the last one I presented is this K-fold CV plus, which it gives you one minus two alpha coverage in theory. And in practice, it tends to be a little bit wider than Jackknife Plus. So there's a little bit, uh, because we didn't do leave one out, we do these K-fold versions, it gives slightly larger than one minus alpha in practice. So there are some you know, trade-offs between theory and practice. This is just a summary table, but again, if you want to see more experiments, please you know, check the paper. So how about like a bootstrap? You know, instead of a K-fold clusterization, you, you know, sample. Yeah, it doesn't have any uh, like distribution-free guarantees by itself the bootstrap by itself but in the papers uh, we have bootstrap versions of this so like if you if you correct the bootstrap uh, using the, you know the like the jackknife to the jackknife plus um this thing where you you use so the, just these variants you have to correct in some sense the bootstrap prediction intervals and and then they have uh, coverage guarantees and so uh, we do that in our papers we have we do it with subsampling and bootstrap based intervals as well yeah so okay it's similar to Jack time for Jack time plus you can think about it that way. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'll just mention that, uh, you know, if you want one state of the art algorithm to try out, we have a, you know, a recent paper, which is published in a, a, a journal special issue uh, on conformal prediction, or we call the algorithm cube. It's for quantile uh, uh, out of box, uh, out of bag predictions. Um, and so the cube algorithm, it combines three different ideas. One is, you know, applying this leave one out jackknife plus. Um, uh, the second is it actually uses a different notion of residual, which is based on quantiles and it trains quantile random forests. And the idea is that if you're trying to, you know, all the algorithms look at one minus alpha or alpha quantiles, that that's what they look at. So why not directly try to estimate the quantiles using quantile random forest and then correct the quantiles using conformal prediction. And so the residual instead of being based on mean prediction is based on, on quantile regression. And so um, that's the second important piece of it. And the third part is that because we use quantile random forest, we don't have to retrain the algorithm n times. We actually have to train the algorithm only once. And we use what are called out of bag predictions to calculate these leave one out scores. And so it's computationally efficient, like split conformal, because you only have to train the algorithm once. But it is statistically efficient because we're using essentially n minus one data points when we are trying to estimate the uncertainty. Um, and so it's computationally and statistically efficient. It works extremely well out of the box in practice because we know kind of random forests work really well just when you when you just train them on any problem and apply them. So we have, we have tried them on a wide variety of you know, different problems and compared them to many other ap ap approaches in literature. And we consistently find that the width meaning the size of the intervals is smallest for cube and the coverage is always in all of these problems it gives you 90% coverage if you in this case we were aiming at 90% coverage we get 90% coverage and so you know there have been many works in the literature with with related ideas but most of them they combine you know something like the leave one out method with out of back but they don't they do it with mean regression but i think it's important actually to do it with quantile regression in practice that that's better at capturing the uh, um, uh, heterogeneity in the noise distribution in different parts of the space somehow quantile regression is the right thing to be using for that so i'll not say more about that but if you know i, I want to present everything from the basics and at least give you state of the art in 2021 where it's the cube algorithm and um, and you can check it out on my website um, there's many open problems you know there's more work to be done on binary classification uh, understanding what exactly conformal prediction is doing, quantifying uh, uh, theoretical guarantees on the, on the size of the set, you know, things of that kind. Uh, how do you use it for algorithm selection? All of this uh, was, uh, you know, we assume that you picked an algorithm, at least a class of algorithm, like a random forest or Kenya's neighbors. But if I want to, if I'm, I have no idea if I want to pick between a deep net or a random forest or a Kenya's neighbors, then, you know, how do I do algorithm selection based on this? Um, how can we prove mathematically that it adapts to parametric assumptions, which means, of course, it works well without any assumptions. But can we prove that if we make some assumptions that automatically the conformal prediction frameworks adapts and gives you something that um, you would have gotten if you had made those assumptions? Um, can we provide mathematical bounds on the, the lower and upper bounds on the width or the volume of that set in certain special cases? Um, so there's a, there's a lot of... Uh, the new settings that one can extend the, these ideas to as well, like streaming settings, time series type of settings, outlier detection. There's been some recent work on this, but I would say that, um, you know, this is still uh, an ongoing area of investigation um, that I hope some of you are encouraged to uh, contribute to. 
Um, let me quickly, maybe uh, I, uh, in 10 minutes, tell you about calibration because many people think about quantifying uncertainty for classification in terms of calibration. Um, and, uh, and so I think about, you know, there's a try, I only have three slides on calibration. So, you know, don't worry, I'm not going to go over time. Um, so calibration, where does it lie? So like, I think of quantifying uncertainty um, as these kind of a, a tripod of concept. So the first one is prediction intervals, which I presented in the top, that's, that's in the top. Um, you can instead say, I want a confidence interval for the function, for the regression function, this expected value of y given x, for example, the, the blue curve or the red curve we saw, or for the decision boundary or something like that. I want a confidence interval for the function. And, um, and so, you know, how do you produce something of that kind? It's different from a prediction interval. And uh, that's typically very hard uh, for in distribution free and non-parametric settings. Uh, it's uh, a very hard problem to produce a confidence interval for the function itself. Um, uh, the last notion is called calibration. And what we would like in calibration is typically that the expected value of y given f of x is f of x. So we make a probabilistic prediction in classification, uh, classification, let's say binary classification, we, instead of uh, producing a set, uh, we produce something like 0.4 or 0.2. Um, then what does 0.2 mean? Uh, we would like it to be the case that the expected value of y whenever we predict 0.2 is actually 0.2, which means that 80% of those examples have label one and 20% of them have, have uh, 80 percent of label zero and 20 percent of them have label one so the downside in binary classification is that the prediction intervals may not be informative because you know you'll just get if you're uncertain of the answer you'll just get the set zero or one you'll just get that uh, if you're sure you'll get zero or one or otherwise you'll get zero and one and so somehow in a multi-class problem if you have thousands of labels then a prediction sets of different sizes is interpretable but when you have only a binary problem then the only prediction sets are zero one zero one and empty and that's not not that nice not as uh, you know informative um, you can prove formally that uh, when you use confidence intervals that the uh, the width of the confidence interval actually provably cannot shrink to zero so you cannot get a notion of consistency in a distribution free fashion it's actually very hard to cover that function uh, but calibration is actually open you can say well can i do calibration in a completely distribution free fashion and the answer is yes and so not many people are aware of it so i thought people you know, i should i should mention it so we are, this is a, from a paper uh, NeurIPS paper in uh, uh, 2020 that we just published um, and we have several other papers in submission right now so you know we say that a function f returns calibrated probabilities um, uh, it's function f maps x to 0 to 1 i'm doing binary classification here so now i have a probabilistic classifier f if the expected value of y given f is equal to f then we say it's, it's calibrated and so essentially it's, it means that intuitively if we predict on unseen data, if we predict FX, f of x as 0.3 for 100 different points, then about 30% of those points will actually have label 1 and 70 will have label 0. That's intuitively what calibration means. So if f is calibrated, you can prove that it must look like expected value of y given g of x for, for some g. It must have that form. Uh, but the reality is you cannot get exact equality with finite samples. If I give you, you know, 2000 data points, you, you cannot get exact equality with these expectations. So you can hope to get what we call epsilon alpha calibration. Okay, it's like uh, uh, high probability calibration bound. So you can say what I would like is Fn, which is some uh, mapping from data to zero one. We will say it has a distribution free epsilon alpha calibration. If for any distribution over the data, the probability of the difference, now we don't have equality, but the difference, the probability that the difference is greater than epsilon is at most alpha. Okay, and so exact calibration would be uh, saying that, uh, you know, alpha is, um, is zero and epsilon is zero, then uh, with probability one, you know, you get equality. Zero, zero is impossible, but high probability bounds are possible. You see, you'll, you'll call this asymptotically calibrated if you if this epsilon n function can be driven to zero as a function of n. And so the first interesting theorem is that many of the things that people use in practice are not, they don't work. They don't have a distribution free guarantee um, uh, because the range of what they use is uncountable. So asymptotic distribution free calibration is impossible if the range of the function is uncountable. So on my last slide, I'll just present a simple binning algorithm 
to give you distribution free calibration it's very much like split conformal prediction but i'm going to call it split binning instead so um so we just split our data into two sets on the first half of our data we train our probabilistic classifier on our second half of the data we split the data into two bins it doesn't have to be two you can split it into 10 bins i'm just showing for visualization two bins so what are these two bins this could be for example the set of points at which my classifier predicts less than 0.5 or greater than 0.5 if you're doing 10 bins you can do 0 to 0 0.1 0 0.1 to 0 0.2 you know something of that kind okay so your second half of the data you split into 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 these into these two bins in this case now when you have a new point you just see which bin does uh, uh, do I get mapped to? So I apply my algorithm A on my new point Xn plus one. It tells me, oh, it's less than 0.5 or greater than 0.5, which means I'm going to look at, let's say, the purple bin. And what I'm going to output is just the average of the Ys in that bin. So I go to the purple bin and I count how many Ys are there, what fraction of Ys are there in that bin. And I output 0.4 or I output 0.2 or whatever, how many ever you know fraction is there. If I have 10 bins, it's the same thing. I just look at which bin I get mapped into and then I output the average of the Ys in that bin. Um, and then, and you can generalize this to any number of bins. The, you can write down explicitly a guarantee. Um, this is an epsilon alpha kind of guarantee where you know alpha is just fixed, like 95% kind of guarantee. And epsilon in this case looks like square root of uh, one over n. Uh, you can think about it that way. There's a sigma hat term, which is an empirical variance of the y's that's always bounded by one. Um, and so you can think about this as a one over root n alpha kind of guarantee. That, that's what you can achieve completely distribution free. Uh, no assumptions on the algorithm that you used or on the underlying distribution. Okay, and uh, there's like you can improve this in many ways to something called uniform mass binning. This is in an ICML paper which just, just got accepted a few days ago, um, going to appear later this summer. Um, but I think this is something that you know at least you know one is it's immediately practically applicable and and uh, some of the earlier ideas can also extend uh, to to this approach. But I'm not going to have time to to mention it. Okay, so in our paper, we mentioned extensions to doing this online. How do you handle covariate shift? How do you handle label shift? Um, you can avoid the sample splitting approach and use all of the data uh, to train and all of the data to, to do binning. You can do that as well. And uh, you know we can extend this to multi-class calibration as well. So if you're um, interested in any of these, you know, please uh, check out our papers. I've, you know, this is on my website. I've just taken this snapshot from my website. Um, uh, some of these are published at ICML and NeurIPS, um, and some of these are uh, published in journals uh, in statistics. So I kind of publish half half in the machine learning literature and the statistics literature. Some of them are in submission, as you can see. Um, and uh, I'll stop there and uh, thank you very much uh, for your attention. And I'm happy to take any questions in the remaining time. Okay. The, uh... Two questions. Um, one is uh, for the uncertainty quantification for the cross validation. How will the fold number of fold affect the you know confidence or, or the you know the uncertainty set? So it doesn't appear in the yeah, bound. That's right. So so it doesn't appear in the bound. So the bound is uh, you know k could be two like you're doing split or k could be n like you're doing leave one out. And uh, you know the bound, the guarantee is completely independent of the bound. But uh, oh, sorry, the bound is completely independent of the number of splits. Um, but the size of the sets that you get could depend on uh, the number of splits. So uh, typically, what happens is in the leave one out approach, it's the most efficient because it's using n minus one points for training, and so it gets the best. Uh, functions A and A, which have the best generalization or the least error. And so they have the smallest residuals. And so the, the size of the set is typically smallest for leave one out. Split approach because you're using about half typically has larger sizes of the set. So even though the theoretical guarantee of validity, there's always two things we're interested in, the validity of the set and the size of the set. And mm -hmm. so the validity part is in, not affected by you know which of these methods you use, but the size of the set is affected. And typically for uh, for smaller k, you have larger size. So if you use tenfold, you'll have a larger size than the one out. Um, and so that's the so. And, but there's a statistical computational trade-off because you gain computational time by doing tenfold. But there's a statistical price to pay, which is you get slightly wider intervals than you could have gotten had you spent more computation. Um, okay. But but our approach cube 
uh, which uses quantile random forest and out of bag uh, gets rid of this uh, uh, dilemma because you, by using quantile random forest and doing out of bag uh, residuals, you can only train once instead of n times and you can apply the jackknife plus even though you only train once on all of the data. And so um, it kind of gets the best of both worlds, which is jackknife plus and uh, computation of split. I see. Great. Thank you. So another question is, uh, uh, for instance, in the case of time series and the data are all dependent, how would you be able to create this uh, data set D1, D2 or? That's an excellent question. I don't know, which is why it, I think uh, it will require some work to extend these ideas to other settings. So I don't know how to apply it to time series. That's why it's still an open problem. Uh, but I think the idea like at a high level, um, I don't think you'll be able to get non-asymptotic guarantees, but asymptotic guarantees might be possible if you do some kind of a cyclic approach. So sometimes what they pe people do in the permutation or a bootstrap is they'll do a cyclic bootstrap or a cyclic permutation test, which is instead of uh, looking at all possible permutations of the data, they will look at how does the algorithm do on X1 to Xn, and then they'll move Xn to the start and on Xn, X1, X2 till Xn minus one, and then they move Xn minus one to the start. And so on Xn minus one, Xn, Xn, X1, X2, Xn minus two. So you can form N cycles that way. And you can look at how your algorithm does, what does it predict on your new point, depending on you know which cycle it is in. And it can use that to make a prediction. I don't think it has any uh, distribution free guarantees, but I think it might have asymptotic guarantees or something like that. So I, that's why I think it's open on how to apply this to that setting. I see. So actually another related question or maybe a different aspect is, so you have these uh, function mapping for X to Y. What happened to unsupervised uh, learning case? Is there anything like uncertainty or uh, your theory can be extended there? Yeah, actually, um, uh, yeah, this, this can be used for uh, you know, outlier detection as well. Um, mm -hmm. in, a, in a completely unsupervised fashion, you're, you're seeing a sequence of X's in a row and you want to detect outliers. You can use this to see um, uh, if the new point, is it exchangeable with the other points? You can use it to test. So it's the same, um, it, you don't need a, a Y, you just need any function, that, any score function that tells you how different is your Xn plus one from X1 to Xn. And mm -hmm. um, and so it, and so it, that and then you can push it through conformal prediction. Mm -hmm. And so it has been used for outlier detection. Uh, I, it has been used for clustering as well. So um, I, I think you you can use these ideas, but I, I don't think it's been. Um, I think these are ongoing works that have come out in the last one one year or so. So I, I wouldn't say these are solved, but I, I think it is in it is an interesting question to extend this to other unsupervised learning settings. Okay, great. Any other question? Yeah, I have one question. Yep, go ahead. Um, yeah, hi, this is Karthik. I'm a faculty member at MBC UI. Yes. Um, so my question is like, how does the, um, I mean, the, in terms of the efficiency, you just talked about uh, on the size of the test, right? But uh, how about the width? Um, so let's say the main width or the main volume uh, compared to distribution based approaches. Like, so let's say I assume some distribution, uh, how will the mere, the width change when I use a distribution free assumption versus a distribution based one? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, so what we can prove is that um, if the distributional assumption is correct, so suppose, um, you know, let's say that you, uh, you're you doing Gaussian process regression or something of that kind, and, and you, you want to use Bayesian uncertainty bands or something of that kind, you can use Gaussian process regression within the conformal prediction framework as well. And you can produce bands that are produced by conformal prediction instead of directly uh, through the Bayesian approach. And then, you know, the things you can prove are if the underlying assumption was correct. So suppose the data was coming from a Gaussian process type assumption, F was drawn from, you know, Gaussian process and your data had some Gaussian noise. And, you know, if, you're, if that assumption was correct, then the conformal prediction bands and the, the Bayesian uncertainty bands, they, they will actually match. Um, they will, I mean, the difference between them will be vanishing with sample size, which means that there'll be a one over root n or a one over n uh, difference in the size of the set. Uh, but if the assumption is not true, then the conformal prediction bands will still be correct. But the Bayesian or any other type of uncertainty bands will lose their guarantee and, uh, uh, when the model is not correct. So in some sense, it gives you 
uh, robustness against model misspecification. But if your model was correctly specified, then you don't lose anything or you lose like a one over root n or a one over n kind of uh, factor. So it might be a little bit wider, but not much. And so uh, you can prove asymptotically that they, they give exactly the same answer. So, I mean, that that's a summary, but um, uh, you know, I can point you to explicit theorems offline if you send me an email. Yeah, thank you. The other question which I had is, uh, you mentioned about outlier reduction, right? So if uh, if your xn plus one is uh, very much outside the distribution of the, the previous x, x1 to xn we have seen, how does this behave? Like, what does the band actually represent? Oh, in our case, it doesn't represent any, like in our case, the guarantee is based on the fact that xn plus one, yn plus one, is exchangeable with xn, x1, y1 to xn, yn. Or another way of saying is they're all iid from the same distribution. Only then we have guarantees. Um, but to answer Lee's question, I said you can use the same idea for detecting outliers. But this everything in my talk, there's no outlier detection. If there are outliers, it won't work. So you have to, you have to assume that the data is iid. And that's okay. if, if you're willing to make that assumption that the data is iid, then this works without uh, any distributional assumptions on on the covariates px, often sometimes you'll read these assumptions like, oh, assume that uh, the distribution of x is bounded or it's a uh, light tailed or, uh, you know, or p of y given x has, you know, uh, two moments or, you know, they, I have at least a variance, finite variance. You'll still read these assumptions in literature. The, everything I presented today is valid without any assumptions whatsoever of that kind, but you need IID. But the same ideas to answer these questions, I can say the ideas I presented here, you can say instead of using them for a predictive uncertainty quantification, I will instead turn them around and I will use them for outlier detection. And I did not present any of that here, but you can use the same principles to detect to, to detect outliers. And so that has been uh, done in the literature and I didn't cover any of that. Too. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, no problem. Any other final quick question? If not, then uh, let's thank uh, Aditya uh, again, and then uh, you will be meeting faculties. There may be more questions, uh, just yeah, coming. No problem. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I will yeah. join the other link in a couple of minutes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Thank Bye. you. Bye.